Um, together, uh, we're going to be going through this afternoon uh, one of the tools that we hope, if you've not already deployed it, that you look at deploying in your network. This is a sinkhole uh, tool. It's a technique that ISPs, various ISPs have been deploying and using for all sorts of different security purposes on the net. Uh, this is part of a series that we've been doing, kind of like an annual series, where we take a real-world ISP security techniques and tools that you can, you know, basically deploy with any, you know, vendor's equipment. We keep it as as neutral as possible, as more of techniques. So uh, the first one uh, where where Chris, Brian, and I did with uh, the UUNet backscatter traceback technique and all the techniques along with that, and then uh, last year Kevin Howell and I did with the CPE protection because of all the CPE break-ins we're seeing with different routers. And so now we're going to do uh, sinkholes for this one. Um, so the objective of all these tutorials is to communicate you know, real-world practices. So these are things coming from you and, and Danny and I kind of our position working with different providers in ISP security space. We can gain from our peers um, kind of like, oh, here's what we're doing with this provider, here's what we're doing with that provider. And they um, permit us to kind of generalize it and express it here so, so others can copy what they're doing without knowing exactly what they're doing or exactly who did this so we don't give away any specific details. So, um, so here we're trying to get everybody in sync with the, with the sinkhole technique. Um, so what are sinkholes? Sinkholes are kind of like you can consider it equivalent as a network equivalent of a honeypot. Uh, it's basically a section of the network that sucks down bad packets. And then when you take those, you take those bad packets and you do things with them. Uh, you can analyze it. You can go through and, and uh, look at what sort of uh, backscatter is coming from it. You can look at attacks in progress. You can take an attack that's hitting one of your customers that's maybe stressing out an aggregation router and redirect it to um, the sinkhole and do your classification and, and mitigation technique off, off the sinkhole. So it's kind of like a multi-purpose tool, which is where we get this Swiss Army knife expression for it, because we're finding um, our peers are coming up and saying, hey, you know, we found this new idea that we can do with the sinkhole. Hey, we found this other idea we can do with the sinkhole. So once people deploy it, they're finding more and more different types of uses for it. They're situational, sometimes to, do, to their network, or sometimes it can apply to everyone. And the ones who are applied to everyone, we try to apply here in, in, in this presentation. So give, give like a general, general scenario, this is what some of the providers do. Aggregation router, and you got like you know, think of a router with a thousand customers, and you got you know one one customer is getting DOS, you know, take like you know, see one customer is getting DOS at 45 megabits of traffic. You know, well, guess what? At 45 megabits of traffic going down that T1, it's going to drop somewhere. What's it going to drop? It's going to drop on the aggregation router. And here you got to go on that router and kind of do something on that router. Well, do you want to really do something on that router where you know many other customers on there and put them at risk? log into a router and drop lots of traffic, you know, the router could be under stress and you want to shove it off there. So what you do with the sinkhole is you take the slash 32 with being hit and you advertise it on the sinkhole. Or a specific prefix says come over here, you know, it could be a slash 24 going to customer, take 32, it goes into the sinkhole. Now you got the traffic going off to the side to a part of your network that's designed to look at traffic. And you can go now go through and throw up a classification ACL, load up a sniffer on it, load TCP dump on it, you know, do, do things like that on it, kind of process and do things off to the side. You don't have to worry about the rest of your customers. Now the customer that who who's being hit here, you know, well you say, well I just dosed him because I took the slash 32 off the side. Well, think about it. the guys getting hit before you find traffic is dosed anyways. But if it's one web server getting hit on a T1 and you pull that 45 megabits off to the side, guess what? You just restored partial service to the guy because the rest of his address space is now working. The slash 32 is being hit, so the slash 32 is now DOS. But the rest of the slash 24, if he had a slash 24, is not DOS. So he can send you an email then. You know, he's got his other services up here. Restored partial connectivity. DOS is still in action, but here you're not jeopardizing your other customers. You got more tools available to you. You know, you can't run a snap on the router. You can take over the same call. You can run a snap on the track. That's what's going on. There's a lot more tools to it. So that this is kind of the general purpose of a of the same call. You're pulling traffic away is one of the techniques for it. This is, you know, you got several providers out there who actually do this now. In this mode, which is kind of like where you have one single in the mode, and then 
um, in another, another book. Other things that people use it for is watch for network scans. Um, you can advertise dark IP space, fail attacks, backscatter. Placement, we'll talk, you know, a little bit more about the placement of it. Many people start with just putting one single out there on the network. Uh, after time, many of them are now towards the handicast model and single as we will go through the section. We'll talk about how to handicast model works with the back. But primarily we go with one sinkhole. We kind of want it in a centralized place in your network. In a place in your network that's not going to be you know overloaded if all of a sudden you shove a bunch of DOS traffic out. The guys that put their sick holes in the middle of the night, it's a bit of on some uh, heavy routers. Others got workstations spread all over the network in the ambulance. So there's many different techniques you can use on this. And the multiple sick hole configuration, this is where you can take the broadcasting, go through the walk through the ambulance, how that works, and how different providers are using the ambulance sick holes. So you can deploy the sick holes widely across your network without having to move circuits all over the place. Um, so why go through this? And why go through this now? Um, well, they work. You know, we got guys out there using them quite a bit. Um, if those of you who are security people who work on security work and you're on the NSP second list, um, you will see people say, "Hey, I just drop this attack into a single." So you see actual big providers out there and they'll say, "Yeah, this attack I black hole or this other attack I dropped it down to a single." Here's the TCP dump off of the attack. That, that sort of stuff. So you see people actively use these um, live attacks and things. Um, and more uses are being found. But the key thing is they take preparation. Uh, sinkholes are not something that you can wait and rip up, which is the key thing where we're bringing this up now. What we find is sinkholes is a very powerful tool for turbo worm meditation. And turbo worms, as we saw with Slammer, are not something that Oh, I got a new turbo worm. Let me go prepare my tools. Well, guess what? Too late. We got a worm that propagates around the planet, you know, in 10 to 15 minutes. You know, 10 to 15 minutes is just time to wake up and log into your computer and realize that, oh my God, something's going on, you know, let alone trying to come up with tools and techniques and, and deploy a sinkhole. You know, these are things you have to have to deploy for. And we're finding the sinkholes are very powerful as, as after you obtain the worm, you track down and start plugging up all the infected machines. Um, so, just to give some clarification of why we call this a sinkhole, because some people have come up and said, why do you call this a sinkhole? Is this a target? Is this just a black hole server? The black hole routers, right, we, we use those to advertise address space. They weren't really security in function. They're a routing function. They're a place to put your aggregate announcements and drop them below zero. And you can place them in many parts of the network. They weren't really built as a security tool. So, a sinkhole goes beyond that. You can use a sinkhole function of the black hole router, we're going to talk about that. Uh, tar pits are places in enterprise networks where you take and slow down connections and things like that. Well, you can put a sinkhole in a tar pit, but a tar pit in, its, in it itself is not a sinkhole. Um, shunts, you know, where you take it and redirect the traffic directly on the router off of the interface. You can put a sinkhole, and that can be a shunt, but a shunt can be many other things in itself. And the same thing with honey nets. You know, honey net has a specific role. You can put a honey net in a sinkhole, but a sinkhole is not necessarily a honey so sinkhole is a much broader term. You can have all these things inside the sinkhole. You can just throw all sorts of things in it. So that's what we call it. Swiss Army knife sort of, uh, sort of tool. So um, now I'm going to hand it over to Danny. Danny's going to go through some of the router basics and some of the you know, ramifications of uh, black hole routers. And by the way, anytime you want, if you want to ask a question, please uh, just come up to the mic. The front mic is the one that's working. And just to kind of introduce yourself.
you know, how much traffic do you send to that sinkhole? And you should be really careful. understand how much traffic you've actually got in prefixes you want to monitor is something you should be aware of. Uh, uh, one of the things as well is that you don't want routers generating tons of unreachable messages, that sort of thing, if a host goes down. So you could put a static ARP on it, you know, kind of like a shun, I guess. Uh, put a static ARP entry on a router to get rid of, uh, to get rid of, uh, you know, the, the un unreachable stuff, that kind of thing. If your box goes down, you can still forward the traffic on the LAN and it doesn't impact anything or send a lot of garbage back out on the network. So. All right, uh, what to monitor in a sinkhole? Uh, dark IP. So dark IP is kind of, uh, you know, I guess a pretty pretty broad term. And, uh, the common definition for that, I guess, if there is one, is, you know, is Bogon space, RFC 1918 kind of stuff. Unallocated address space from your own network that, that either hasn't been allocated or, uh, you know, isn't used or, you know, uh, or, you know the RFC 1918, those sorts of things. Uh, and you know what you can do by you know by watching this address space. Now you should be really careful because you know again the, the amount of amount of data that comes to the, this address space is uh, is more than most people expect. So uh, so you should be aware of you know of how much you're going to monitor and start small either with you know unallocated backbone or infrastructure links that sort of thing or unallocated customer prefixes or uh, you know or just uh, you know one of the RFC 1918 prefixes that sort of thing. So. Uh, you can monitor again. You can monitor backscatter. Uh, you know, backscatter from attacks. I want to talk about ba what backscatter is in just a moment. If you're not aware, uh, dark IP stuff. Uh, you know, who's scanning? So just by putting one IP address there. I mean, I have one IP address on one of my home subnets that I monitor, and it's amazing actually how many how many scans you see a day. Just you know, random scans, and you know, they're probably compromised hosts that uh, they're scanning looking for some exploit, right? So you can you can get a handle on those things. So. All right, so monitor scan rates is, uh, you know, there, there are lots of tools to do this. I work for Arbor, and, you know, our company has a tool that does some of this, but there's a ton of stuff out there that's free that does this as well. Uh, and, you know, to, uh, you know, to get something in place and free and start with your small sinkhole and actually understand what's going on on your network and, you know, get an idea about what's happening is, is kind of the, uh, you know, the goal here. I guess that's what we're trying to get across is to, you know, be prepared and understand what's happening on your network. So. Okay, so this is this is actually a screenshot from some of our stuff. Uh, when uh, a, a worm actually and it shows a list of uh, infected hosts down at the bottom, and you can actually see a huge spike there. And this was from a sinkhole. And if you're monitoring this, you can say, "Whoa, look at that!" You know, the the, the average rate, you know, above what I expected for this interface or this device or this prefix went up. And uh, and you know, here's a list of all the hosts that were scanning this prefix. So they're probably all compromised, or you know, they've been infected by this worm or whatever it was that happened. You can you can actually figure it out versus just assuming that there's a bunch of noise on your network that day and you know and discarding it because it will grow so all right monitoring backscatter uh, so let me actually here we go uh, so let me talk about backscatter real quick first is, so what you see here is this is you know I, I don't know where the term backscatter actually came from I'm guessing that you know Kata used it first I don't know if it came from elsewhere but it's it's what you see in this example actually is a couple of packets uh, with spoof, uh, spoof source addresses here and uh, so they're hitting some victim. In this case, this is the victim, and uh, and then the victim's replying back to you know B, D, and C in this case, and that's what's you know that's that's somewhat referred to as backscatter. It can also come from you know router unreachable messages or you know uh, you know a number of things, and that's that's the backscatter that we're talking about. So if you can get a handle on on you know where that data is going back to and watch that, you can get a good idea about you know what's happening. So. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah, you really help. Okay. Um, one, one of the things when you put backscatter inside your network is, and you only monitor, say, like, you know, say, say if you take um, your router, your sinkholes, and you put your, um, all your, you use it as your, your black hole generators for your, um, for your route advertisements. So you take all your, your CIDR aggregate blocks and you stick them on your sinkholes and then you can watch the backscatter. And one of the one of the providers, this is how they kind of get an early indication of wh which of the customers are being attacked, because they see only the backscatter from their network, you know, from all the networks that provide to them, and that will give them an indication. Okay, which of my customers are getting hit? Which customers getting ready to call me? And 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 this one guy said that you know it's really fun sometimes to have the customer call the escalated tone and says, Oh yes, hey, how you doing? I understand you're under attack right now. I can see it on my monitor right now. Let's let's go ahead and plug this up. Um, you know, it helps you get in more proactive mode with your customers that way. So backscatter is pretty pretty in, nice tool internally if you set it up. 
Uh, yeah, we actually have a couple of examples on how you do that with your aggregates in a moment. Uh, you know, your, your network aggregates. So. Anyway, that was the, the CADA stuff. You know, you can go there and look at some of the, the analysis and some of the other things they did on backscatter. It's actually pretty interesting. And the uh, the backscatter, you know, the traceback stuff that you know that Chris and uh, and Rob and uh, I guess Brian Grant, Jim Blumen and a few other folks from World Common and elsewhere uh, did, and they presented. Uh, I think the Toronto and Analog is still still online. So if you want to go back and have a look at that, if you know if, if it makes more sense now, that's something you ought to, ought to do. It's pretty cool as well. So. Uh, monitoring speed ranges. Okay, so this is just a sample of uh, you know of, of an account accounting via packet filter that's looking at some address ranges, right? So this is pretty. Yeah, this this is Jeff. Jeff went out one time. There's this, this was actually cut and paste from an analog discussion where there was an analog discussion about how many spoofed addresses in Bogon space are there really out there? You know, and, and this is like packets. So he he had some router somewhere in the network and he just did a classification ACL, which was all permits. And all denies. In this one, this was his deny case, and he just, you know, this is all source addresses out of the Bogon space, and he just said, okay, how many, how many's out there? Throw out there and just look at counters, and he was like surprised over his network that there were that many spoofed Bogon addresses out there on his network. He didn't think there was any. By the way, Barry did most of these slides and gave them to me about an hour and a half ago. So uh, <laughs> if it seems like he knows some of them better than I do, then that's probably why. So. All right, so uh, right there. Okay, so now I'm to uh, sinkholes and internet facing, and, and what this actually looks like. And what you see here is, uh, okay, so uh, uh, a common, I guess, uh, you know, a current practice of service providers is to announce your network aggregates only the, you know, the the the, mo the most or the longest or the shortest prefix. I'm sorry, to announce the shortest prefix for your network aggregates and only one, and uh, and advertise that from you know a single announcement out of your network and. And what that does is that any of the unallocated address space within that block ends up getting dumped on your router, and your router's got to handle that. And so that's that's what you're seeing here. You see the large large cider block is being uh, is being announced, and uh, all the garbage packets, you know, to, to either scans or you know or backscatter or, or whatever it is, is is being sent to your router and just tossed. And you can actually analyze that data since you're carrying it on your network anyway. So that's what this is getting at. Uh, there's actually. Uh, all right, so uh, so it wasn't a big deal, you know, that, that that bit of noise that you saw, the backscatter and the, the random scans and that sort of thing. When you know when there were ten hosts somewhere that someone manually compromised, but you know with with botnets or you know these, these zombie networks that have 150,000 nodes and all of them have you know 10 meg DSL access or something of the sort, it becomes a lot more significant. And so you know to just throw that stuff at a router and fill up a single link in your network or a couple of links in your network and you know and pound your routers either you know if they can do unreachables or you know echo replies whatever the whatever the uh, the attack you know characteristics are if they can respond to those or handle those in hardware well you know when the volume goes way up the uh, you know the overhead on your router and your network and you know and your service availability are impacted so so uh, one of the things you could do actually is uh, is spread out, take some of those unallocated blocks and actually throw them on, uh, you know, into your scene coli or some or all of them, you know, depending on the volume of traffic and what you want to handle. And so uh, that's that's what you're seeing here. And uh, basically, I guess, uh, hang on, I'm lost here. These are very slides. You <laughs> So, uh, so basically, uh, pull in you know s certain certain allocated prefixes, certain blocks from the uh, from from your aggregate, from the network aggregate, or a set of the aggregates, or just your infrastructure address space, and, and get an idea about what's going on instead of just letting your router dump the traffic or the router become the uh, you know become the victim, right? So, uh, so but one of the things you got to be aware of, right, is if you're going to announce more specifics for your larger network aggregates. One is you definitely don't want to leak those aggregates out of your network, so put imp or put explicit policies in place to handle that, and uh, and make sure uh, other things. If if you were to announce those prefixes, right, or you decide to change your announcement policies, things like MEDs could be affected. Which you know, I have an issue with MEDs. That's you know, a separate issue, so I won't get into that. But uh, you know, MEDs could be affected based on your announcement policies. Those sort the sort of things that uh, you know that come from central network aggregation and uh, you know and break break other routing stuff. So. Anyway, uh, okay. So uh, the uh, default route on a customer CP device, you know, it's it's the ultimate, I guess, the ultimate uh, vacuum for you know for garbage, right? So what you're seeing is uh, they have a default route, and you know they get a lot of garbage, and they don't have anywhere else to send it. They're going to send it to you. So uh, if you analyze that, you can get an idea about what's going on. So all right. So I've actually talked about some of this, and uh, a lot of it's just you know there's a lot of volume there. 
and the uh, you know the amount of traffic or you know what you'd otherwise consider noise and so to analyze that and you know the overhead of it how you handle that traffic is going to become more and more significant especially the sinkholes and you know and and you know, these botnets grow and the bandwidth and you know the capabilities and characteristics grow so to, to try and get a handle on that would be a good thing so. all right uh, dark IP space uh, advertising dark IP space and sending it back in your sinkhole that's what you see here is uh, you advertise, you know, unallocated uh, infrastructure addresses, unallocated customer blocks, Bogon space, RC 1918, wh whatever it is. It's, it's not a big deal to allocate address space out of your, uh, I mean, to, uh, to announce more specifics of unallocated address space or Bogons within your network and just keep them inside your network. So does that make sense? Is everyone with me here? No questions so far? Let's see. Maybe I've lost someone. Everyone following me or just reading email? Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. All right. So anyway, let's just hurry up then. No, so, so what you see here is any casting holes. What you could do is because this is a lot of volume, a lot of data. You see, uh, so you put sinkholes in different places in your network and uh, announce the, you know, uh, either the same addresses or different address ranges out of those sinkholes, and you can handle the volume better. You know, and, and handle things that would otherwise be pummeling a router, you know, and you, with no visibility, kind of transparently, and you just see a router CPU go up and, and not know what's actually happening in your network. So. If you know, if you get to the point where you want to monitor things on a network-wide basis and scale it, you know, to, to put multiple sinkholes in your network for different prefixes or to anycast the same prefixes is is one of the options you might want to take. So, and this is kind of actually how we've seen some of the service providers we've worked with, Barry and I, both uh, grow their sinkholes. They started with the Unix box and then they went to distributed, you know, multiple sinkholes in different places in their network for different prefixes, and then to anycasting them so that the, there's low distribution because you know. The, the characteristics of, of different attacks typically, you know, target one or two sources versus an array of sources, uh, or you know, one or two prefixes, should we say? So if you can spread that out over your network, it's uh, it's a little more robust and uh, gives you a better handle on scaling. So, and uh, that's it. So, uh, any questions so far before Barry comes back up? And uh, so, any any casting, um, I mean, any casting is a technique that how many people well let's ask this question how many people are actively using any cast in their networks today so this is this is one of the things i was wondering because any cast has been out for quite a while and one of the things i realized was there's a lot of different providers out there that uh, don't realize this technique is out there they don't, don't know they could use it as a services and, and what's interesting is a couple of big providers i asked their backbone crews are you guys any cast and dns and it was like silence and, you know it was something that was done like five years ago and it's still there but they didn't know what it was running or not you know it just works so any cast is one of those techniques that really works it came up with and we we use it with dns services probably the most common purpose of it we also use it for advertising our our distributed sinkholes and and also for black hole route advertisement like for instance when you take inside your core and you take your aggregate blocks, you take your entire aggregate space and you want to advertise it out as the prefixes. And you do it inside your core. You never do it on just one of your backbone core routers. You do it maybe on three or four of them. That's actually any cast in those, you know, big blocks of slash 19s or slash 18s or slash 20s. You know, that's an any cast technique because you put on many routers. Any cast, that's an any cast technique. Um, and then some, some guys use any cast for route convergence. There's some route convergence tricks with it. Now this thing all came up with sinkholes because there's one one big provider. He started and he did a sinkhole and he just did some dark IP address space, just address space that belonged to him. But more specifically, yeah, this is pretty cool. Hey, let me let me go through and, and read Chris Chris and Brian's document on on doing backscatter traceback. You know, backscatter traceback. A sinkhole is one of the pieces of the three pieces of the puzzle with backscatter traceback. And in there, they said, you know, Chris and Brian said, oh yeah, we use 96/3. So, so he took 96 slash 3 and sticks them on a sinkhole, and he goes like, boom. He, said, he says, I DOS myself because there was so much backscatter on my network. When I put out 96 slash 3, all this traffic just whacked me, and I didn't. He was just overwhelmed by circuits going into my lab. You know, he didn't expect that much traffic com coming into it. So, so he called me, he shut it off, and he called me and says, what can we do? He says, well, why don't we spread it all over your network? We just put sinkholes all over the place. And then, you know, because that's actually what's going on right now, because you're dropping packets all over your network with backscatter. They're dropping on routers silently, and it just packets getting dropped. And if we want to, want to use it with backscatter, then we anycast it. And then they'll get pulled into different parts of your network instead of just one part of your network. So you don't get, 
you don't end up DOSing yourself. So that's where they use an anycast or backscatter came from. So in a DNS model, because that's a good reference model, and it's kind of like a similar reference model, we got DNS servers sitting out there in different parts of your network, and we anycast them. And the idea, in basic anycast, we, we basically got, you know, it's the, the, the Microsoft, your DNS client. You have two, two DNS IP addresses. And you take those same two DNS IP addresses, you just stick them on every single one of these servers, and you advertise them in your network. So anybody, anytime when somebody tries to resolve one of the addresses, you know, that's in your little, you know, in my case, a, a Microsoft client, you know, and it tries to resolve one of those DNS addresses, it goes to the closest one to you, right? And you can do this via border gateway protocol. There's a border gateway protocol technique for doing it, and there's an interior gateway protocol techniques for doing any cast in this way. And some people, even to protect their DNS servers, they take one of the two DNS addresses and put it in the IGP, so it's only reachable inside the network. And the other one on their uh, border gateway protocol that gets advertised out to the world, so it protects their DNS cache servers that way. So this is kind of known. We know how to do this. So when you can do the same sort of thing with sinkholes. So in this case, you know, here here's a guy, um, little DNS forward, and it's not, you know, that needs to be changed. But basically, you take the customer, and he's sending out, you know, he's infected. He's got slammer or something infected. And when you take and try to go through and send him to a sinkhole, he'll go to the closest sinkhole. Instead of to one central sinkhole, it'll go to the closest one. And then as you stretch that across your network, it allows you, you know, to be pushed out to the edge that, that, that way. You know, so it distributes distributes the effect. So this is the idea with the intercast sinkhole. Uh, a configuration example for this. This is kind of like a configuration example taken from a typical, you know, DNS sort of configuration, where I have servers in inside on my inside of my network. And these can be, you know, sniffers or other things inside that I want to send traffic over to. And I got two addresses on it. I got one address I use for management. I go to that and configure and log on and do things with it. And the other address is the address I'll use for, for my sinkhole that I'll advertise everywhere, the same address everywhere. And when I advert inside my network, I just, in my little sinkhole, I use interrogatory protocol. And then outside, I got border gateway protocol advertising my network in this example. So, so when I go through and trigger and say, okay, say like the top one, say server instance A, um, when server instance A is my sniffer and I want to send stuff over to my sniffer, then I send out and use that one uh, slash 32. In this case, it's 10.001 slash 32 and use that one to uh, send it out. So, um, so with the sinkhole, sinkhole's you know, designed to pull an attack and, and the anycast placement allows me to go through and place multiple sinkholes across my network without going through and doing major re-architecting of my network. And we kind of know we got several providers who, are, who have done this now. That's how they've deployed their sinkholes. They started with one and they moved down to an ACAST model because it's very easy for them to find an extra port somewhere in a POP or an extra port in a peering connection and stick a little switch off of it and some, some extra low, you know, extra routers off the side of it in their, in their rack space to build the sinkhole in that particular colo location. They spread them all over the place and then control it essentially from their security desk where they do the security mitigation work. So, um, and you know, this is just kind of like, you know, example of spreading across into the like a regional data center sort of approach, or you can push them all over the edge, or you know, there's all sorts of flexibility that you can do with any cast of, of flexibility. Otherwise, if you have one central one, then you're talk about you know upgrading circuits and controlling the bandwidth going into the sinkhole and having you know the concern of having too much of the attack traffic going into your sinkhole and saturating the links going into the sinkhole because a lot of traffic. Build up that way. So, um, so I can kind of consider this in the early stages because you know I, I got you know only a few providers who are doing this, but we, as more people are looking at this, we'll probably see more traction. Hopefully, more people kind of look at this as a valid security tool and deploy them. Uh, the ones who had these deployed during Slammer um, were in a good advantage because they were able to use the sinkholes to say, okay, I got six different sinkholes, and hey, you know. The west side of my backbone in the United States has more slammers <laughs> than my east side of the United States. They are actually are able to look at the different sinkholes and say, in this case, using it to track the turbo worms, they're able to say, like, oh wow, they're able to get regionalized data to find out, okay, where should we put most of our help desk support to help our customers to plug up the slammer? And they're able to get some kind of regional view with it, with the sinkholes going on out there. So that's that's another plus for it. Um, 
another, this is none of one of those te techniques, these tricks that somebody came up to me and said, like, hey, you know, here's another technique we found. This is in protecting your point to point links inside your backbone. So, here in this case, you have a, a point to point link on a backbone, and you got to think about what, what sort of traffic goes across on a point to point link, right? This is like, you know, inside your backbone. So, when you think about it and you break it down, you know, border gateway protocol, NTP, things like that, inside your network, you're, you're using loopbacks, right? And so your loopback addresses, right, are not your point-to-point -point links, right? They're separate. Your ones who use the point-to-point -point links are things like your interrogate protocols, you know, things like um, your your link protocols, right? Now those, when they when they look at the look at it, they all they need is to see the connected route because it's directly connected. So they don't actually need a routing protocol to come up and run it because they're sitting adjacent to each other, right? So when it comes to like you know being able to send traffic to these point-to-point -point links, right? You don't really need the outside world to be able to get to these point-to-point -point links. I mean, do they really need? Does somebody really need to ping your backbone link? Does somebody really need to ping you know some customer outside the planet need to ping your OC one eight two OC forty eight links? You know, not 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 really. You know, when you think about it, but people can trace route because they can trace route. These are the addresses that show up. Because they trace route, these addresses show up. People can say, ah, here's intelligence for me to have a target. If I want to go after and attack a router, I do a trace, a couple of trace routes to a provider, and I get enough addresses on the point-to-point -point links that I can go out there and whack, whack the routers. So to protect them in the past, people have used different things to protect these, these infrastructure point-to-point -point links. People have used ACLs in the past. Some people have tried using RFC 1918 you know, as, as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, but you have problems with reflection attacks with it, um, which I'll, I'll talk about what a reflection attack is. So, so one idea that one of the, one of the guys came out with says, "Hey, you know, they had this. Uh, what happened was a scenario where one of the customers was attacked. So they went, they jumped in to help the customer out, and then the the attacker shifted the attack off of the customer and attacked the routers that supported the customer. So the attack target shifted from the customer." to the service provider's routers, to hit the service provider's routers, you know, and so here they're going, okay, what are we going to do now on these backbone links to protect it? And what they did is they, they threw in a sinkhole and they basically took their, all their infrastructure blocks, all the point-to-point -point link addresses inside the network, and they advertised it off the sinkhole. And what that did is the attack that was going after a, a one of their routers, point-to-point -point links, all went down into the sinkhole. Right, so it shoved, shoved it down down to the sinkhole. So it was a way for them to protect their the point to point links that way. All right. So so in this case, give give an example here. Um, you know, it's 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 not a, oh the point here is it's not a perfect sort of solution because there are links that, for instance, when I go say like in this case the top uh, attack flow, I'm going after 198.022, uh, which is that first link, that first router in. So that first router in there, this technique wouldn't protect that one because router A, which is my border router, the parent router, has a connected prefix going to that, right? But if the second one, the one on the bottom, which is 198.02.5, that's inside. That's that's uh, more than two hops into my network inside my backbone. Anything I try to send beyond there would go down to the same point. So like a lot of security solutions, it's it's not a perfect solution, but it is a tool. It's a technique that you can turn on. So it's one of those things that if you plan for it, you can go through and just set up a little rule and have you know all your infrastructure addresses you know handy that you can go through and inject them if you want to. So what this one provider does is they have a, a their, their sinkhole ready to, to turn on. They don't have it turned on all the time, but they have it ready to turn on, and they know exactly all their addresses. And so if this situation happens again, they can easily go on the box, activate the little rule they have prepared, and be able to use this technique to protect some, some of their infrastructure addresses. All right, so so this is kind of like, you know, uh, traffic getting shut down into the sinkhole instead of being sent off into uh, one of the point-to-point -point addresses. Now, uh, another thing is, you know, some people say, well, RFC 1918 addresses, right? Oh, I use RFC 1918 addresses. But, you know, and some people would come and say, yeah, but, RFC 1918 addresses as point-to-point -point infrastructure addresses, which RFC, you know, says you shouldn't use in the public internet space. But people say, oh, give me more security because people can't attack me then. But then nobody ever mentions to them, well, you can do a reflection attack, 
and, and the reflection attack is where I send in addresses which are basically RFC 1918 addresses. It's spoofed in my source addresses. And then I hit customers who have access to my network. And then what happens is my customers then reply to my infrastructure addresses, which are RFC 1980 addresses. So you get all this backscatter junk and this reply, this reflection, and that's called a reflection, that's targeted at a particular interface. So in this case, my reflection target is, is on router B, and I, I use that as a, as a reflection target. And so again, here, this is one of those things where if you have a black hole, the, the infrastructure, black hole and the infrastructure addresses is a technique that you can use to mitigate when, if this sort of thing happens with these sort of reflection sort of attacks. Um, and this is especially common true as people start to also look at, um, you know, putting ACLs on the edge. When you put ACLs on the edge, protecting infrastructure blocks, you got, got to not only do stop the destination address, but you also got to do the anti-spoof, the source address. So you got to have an ACL that's constructed just like an enterprise ACL where you don't allow any source address to equals my own block, my infrastructure blocks, and no destination address going into my infrastructure blocks unless it's explicitly permitted, like an EBGP parent connection. So you got to do both. Some, some, some providers I was talking to were just doing one, they were just doing destination, I said, but you got to do both, otherwise you're vulnerable to these sort of reflection attacks um, out there. Now, while all this is building up to, and for, for, for this tutorial, and we'll probably get, get over it sooner or quicker unless the, the uh, people have a lot of questions on it, is, is preparing for the next Turbo One. Usually we do these in the fall and then off, but we were asked to maybe kind of do this this time as kind of like preparing for the next Turbo One. Now, we all know we got hit with this guy, with Slammer. And as we talked about the last Nanog when we did the post-mortem on it, you know, thank, thank goodness we had started working on ways of talking to each other ISP to ISP because it was ISPs that saw this thing first and, and because we had NSPSEC and a couple other tools out there to talk to each other, we were able to, to quickly figure out how to contain it and, and do the containment filters up to, to, to stop it. Otherwise, this thing would have just been a really real nightmare. You know, it was pretty bad, but it was a real nightmare. Once you contain a worm, right, you know, kind of like there's three stages of, of worm mitigation. Stage one is identifying what's going on. Stage two is containing it. It's kind of like, like, you know, SARS out in Asia. You kind of contain it. You got to isolate it. You got to, you know, section it off in this part of the network. And then the third thing, you got to actually go out there and cure it. You got to fix it. Well, what happened with Slammer is luckily we had people out there that can identify it quick and we figure out a containment quick. But then what happened is it took quite a while to start clearing up the problem. And the ones who were able to clear it fast were the people out there with sinkholes. Because one of the things that a sinkhole would do is a sinkhole would give you a statistic from the backscatter off the worm or the scans off the worm. You get two sort of things got through there. You're getting the, the worm actually hitting you because these worms go out there and start scanning, you know, the entire internet space. And so if you have some bogon space and some dark IP space on your sinkhole, guess what? Your sinkhole is going to pick that up. It's going to say, hey, you know, I got all these scans going on here. You know, what's what's going on? Somebody's scanning me here. Let's identify this. Let's fire at my sniffer and kind of take a packet capture and say, oh, this is a worm. Um, and the other thing you're going to get out of it is the backscatter from all the other failed attempts across your network. So you're going to get two towards sorts of data in there going to your sinkhole. With it. And what you get out of this out of your sinkhole is who's infected. Because, you know, you got a computer infected, and the computer's not trying to hide the fact that, hey, I'm infected. You know, I'm, I'm trying to infect you. It's, it's like Code Red, Ninda, you know, Slammer, all. You can easily use the sinkholes that go back and say, these are my infected hosts. And this is the third stage of, of containing, can, containing the worm, which is you actually got to clean it up. Right? And the providers that had these in, their networks, were able to go through and, and we contained it, and then they were out there to go out there and get their customers fixed because they had these sinkholes in place. Other guys had to go out there and build the sinkholes you know, while Slammer was going on so they can start identifying who's, who's affected and clean them up back afterwards. Um, in this case, this is actually emulating, you know, what's, what happens in Cisco. Cisco, the, we got um, uh, sinkholes that are, we know our providers, all, all of our upstream providers that Cisco uses have sinkholes deployed. So we know that the providers can use it. And then inside our DMZ area, we got one, and that's the most active one. That's the one that we use all the time. 
because it's in the DMZ area. You know, it's in, in between, you know, firewall layers, right? And then inside Cisco's corporate network, we got sinkholes deployed all over across the entire global corporate IT network. Those mainly sit around most of the time idle, and every now and then, especially we'll get lab servers pop up with like code red and MD infections. They'll be, get about two or three code red and MD infections a month that pop up. And they're able to spot them right away. The sinkholes just pick them right up and say, ah, okay. And they're able to go down and they, they go over to the lab and they disconnect the lab from, you know, and then they call up the lab admin and say, okay, one of your machines is infected out of, you know, let's, let's plug it up, let's fix it, let's get a patch sort of thing. And so you're able to spot these inside the corporate network quite effectively. So the sinkhole concept is not just something that you can do in an ISP backbone scenario, but inside in, in a service provider's own service infrastructure, corporate infrastructure, your customers in an enterprise scenario, it's a it's a, a tool out there that's good for the warrant mitigation. So so in summary the nature of the threat in Slammer's case, you know, the, the, the thirty minutes is thrown out. It was more it was more like, you know, 10, 15 minutes when you look at some of the studies of the spread of the infection vector. When you got turbo worms that, that go out and spread that fast, you can't wait until the worm happens to go and build these tools. And since these tools are not rocket science, right? None of the things here is, is hard, right? And they're not expensive because, you know, as I said, we got guys who just took a spare workstation, loaded up Zebra and, and TCP dump on it, and they had their sinkhole, right? So they're not expensive to do. And with any cast deployment, you don't have to re rebuild your network to deploy them, all right? So it's, it's not like uh, something you can say, well, all these different excuses why you don't deploy them. But you can't wait until the next turbo worm happens to deploy them. It's something that you got to do now to prepare for the next turbo worm. Now we know the next turbo worm is going to happen. We don't know when. We don't know what the attack vector is going to be and the infection vector is going to be for the next turbo worm, but we know it's going to happen. We also know because, you know, it was, you know, I was knocking my head on the table when we had last Nanog and we had people up here on stage saying, um, here is all the errors they made in the slammer, inf you know, scan rate. You know, and say like, you know, slammer was fast, but you know, they made all these computational errors, and they could have been faster. You know, and here's the math of how they could have been faster. <laughs> you know, and you see, you see, you know, um, people do that sort of analysis, which is very useful analysis. But then somebody who's probably planning these next sort of ones is looking at that. You know, get it from 10-minute global spread to like a five-minute global spread. Right? So. So the key thing here is be prepared. And that's what this talk is about for that. So, um, and on here, we'd like to, you know, thank some of the contributors on here. Some of the people contributed this over time. You know, Tim Dallas, Chris Morrow, Phil Offer, Roland Dobbins over from, who runs our Cisco DMZ, and many, many other guys helped, helped Danny out put this together. And now we're, we're open for questions, comments. Questions and comments. War stories. Anybody who's had a sinkhole, who, who's found some interest and uses for it, they we have not expressed. <laughs> okay. Well, if there is nothing out there, Danny will be up. Danny and I will be up here for anybody who wants to come up to the stage. Because a lot of times in security, nobody wants to get up and talk security when it's being taped to be replayed on the internet. Um, so we will uh, close up and we'll be here and then we'll see. hopefully see everybody tonight at the security boff. And those of you who don't know about the security boff, that's our kind of like a regular meeting where we're take, trying to take one piece at a time and do more and more security on the internet and working with each other. And so we'll be talking some more what's going on with NSPSEC. If you don't know what NSPSEC is, come to the Security Boss and find out. Okay, thank you. <laughs>